Thanks for joining us this week for my conversation with Reba Connell, a licensed clinical social worker and certified mental health integrative medicine professional whose Nourish Your Mood program supports clients with issues ranging from depression and anxiety to other feelings of emotional imbalance to feel more empowered in coming back to balance by focusing on mindfulness, body liberation, and nourishing food. She's also passionate about social programs, equity, and cultural representation. I know you're going to get so much out of this conversation that we share today, and I'm so grateful to have you here with us. Living in a stressful world doesn't mean you have to give up on happiness. Instead, you can shift your perspective of stress and discover how to live your life in flow. Welcome to Happified. I'm your host, Susie Vine. Join me for inspiration and interviews with folks who are shining their light in the world in the areas of positive mindset, health, and wellness. I'm so happy to have you here. Welcome back. I am so happy to have you with us this week for my conversation with Reba. L. Rebecca Connell is a certified mental health integrative medicine professional and licensed clinical social worker. Teaches nourish your mood, meditation and eating with the brain in mind and mindfulness-based stress reduction. Reba specializes in anxiety and chronic pain, drawing on the latest evidence-based approaches, including mental health nutrition and eating meditation. She teaches therapists, healthcare providers, and stressed out people to balance their mood and investigates the connection between mood and food with curiosity and self-compassion. Reba has studied with Dr. Leslie Korn and many of the leaders in mental health nutrition and functional medicine. She's completed professional training in teaching mindfulness-based stress reduction under the direction of John Kabat-Zinn and Dr. Saki Santorelli, and a training in teaching mindful eating through UCSD. Reba enjoys studying energy psychology, emotional freedom technique, tapping, qigong, and yoga. She's a member of the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health. Reba lives and works in Huchin, the traditional homeland of the Chochenyo speaking Lashan Ohlone people, the past, present, and future stewards of the land now also known as Oakland. Reba deeply cares about food justice and hopes will envision and collaborate to create a world where nourishing food is available to us all. Just reading this information, Reba, I'm just so touched by the depth and breadth of your work and the focus of heritage and inclusion. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm excited about this conversation. Thanks for having me, Susie. And I love the um, focus that you have brought in, not only on a lot of cultural focuses and practices like Qigong and the power of breath work, but also your focus in functional functional health and integrative health education. And what inspired you to bring this focus into your practice? Uh, thanks for asking. I always knew that I wanted to do some kind of mind body health, even before I chose my graduate school. So uh, that was always on my mind somehow. Um, when I first graduated from undergrad, my, my undergrad degree was a degree that I created myself. I designed my own major, which at Brown is called a concentration. And that was called Voices in History, a study of writings by Blacks and women in the Americas. Uh, and then I was invited to help plan a conference on Jewish women and the body when I first uh, moved out here to the Bay. And so I was very interested in mind-body approaches. And then my very first job out of undergrad, I got repetitive strain, which is really 
um, you know, epidemic in our time, you know, that computer injury, so many people getting that. And even at that time, when I was so young, I remember saying, but I already knew the mind and body are connected. Why did I have to suffer to, you know, have more understanding of that? But so there's been so many times that my own difficulties have led to the absolute necessity to learn more. And then I got so excited by that. I want to share that with others. So it was going through the repetitive strain was one aspect. And then also going through digestive issues led to more, which I can tell you about later. But so that was some of the early inspiration. And uh, yeah, that was some of the beginning um, is just my own, you know, that was when I started doing more meditation, more yoga, more Tai Chi. Yeah. I love it. And, and I find that to be the case too. The more that I learn, the more I see in the experience, but also through hindsight, how the lessons have had me relearn or, or revisit the information. So to really integrate it and to learn the, the value of it <laughs> and to live it instead of just knowing the information, which I think sometimes is a bit of a disconnect. We might receive information, but putting it into practice and integrating it is, is a next level. Yeah, that's really true. And that's why what I teach is really not strong on um, forwarding information first, but more about getting in touch with our own knowing. Um, and the information is part of it. Um, I'll get to that a little bit later. But in terms of inspiration, you know, my teacher, Leslie Korn, uh, she went to, um, to Mexico and she also got a digestive illness as a young person when she was living there and she lives there still. And the healers, the traditional um, indigenous healers healed her there. And that's really what started her on her journey. And so many of the different people that I follow are people who maybe got trained in some kind of more what's called, you know, traditional, but is really quite new, like just in the last hundred or 200 years type of approach to medicine. And then when they got their own difficulty with mental health, they realized that they'd come to the limits of their paradigm and they needed to learn more. And so that's been my experience as well. So the, after doing a lot of my own healing around, around pain, it turned out that food was the next step of that. And I did not want to, I did not want to, I did not want to remove anything I was already eating or put in anything else new. And it was just this kind of thing where you put your fingers in your ears when people talk to you about like, no, 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 are you talking to me? Um, and then I found it to be so profoundly helpful for my pain and for my sleep and for my anxiety um, that I got really lit up about learning more. And that's what I love to teach others. And I think that's what really makes the message powerful is because you can empathize with your patients and clients and at a level that perhaps they haven't found in other spaces. And so that can really facilitate healing. And so you mentioned um, how it can work to support anxiety and depression and how does that integrative health aspect, um, do you consider yourself kind of a translator to help people work with perhaps what they've been led to follow, you know, these plans that they might've received from other practitioners. And you really have a lot of education or introduction work to kind of bring this comprehensive approach to people. Um, interesting. I, I think translation might be part of what I do. Um, it's not usually about what people have received from other practitioners as much um, uh, as like not, not exactly about like implement, you know, the way that a health, a health coach might do that who's working with a functional medicine doctor to help people, you know, move that forward and make it more, you know, realistic and break, break it down into steps, not really as much with that. Um, but I'm often challenging um, in a gentle way some of the things that people have already received, actually. So it's more of a, of a countercultural experience of helping us find different paths. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that um, broadening of outlook can be really powerful to let people know that, you know, they have that opportunity to find solutions, you know, that they might have limited themselves to before. So I'm curious about um, nourishing the mood and, and what are the foundations of that practice or that you're sharing with your clients? 
Thank you so much. So, uh, so Nourish Your Mood is based on three um, foundations um, that are really um, important. And one of them is mindfulness. And when I say the word mindfulness, I'm really talking about a mindfulness that is profoundly respecting each person as their own teacher and guide and is open to being surprised by, by what we find. So sometimes words like this start to get used so much that they can uh, get a little bit diluted in what they mean, um, diluted or diluted, <laughs> both. Um, and so it's not about trying to achieve any particular result. Um, and it's also so important to remember that mindfulness is not about requiring focus. So often, and this happened just yesterday, I will talk to students and they will say, I wasn't able to achieve a blank mind. And so being with a teacher is one way to bring a lot more compassion to our experience. And there's no need to have a blank mind. And many, many very experienced teachers do not have a blank mind. So it's about this presence and curiosity. And so that's a way we can start to notice oh, if I get more subtle and nuanced about noticing things, then I can start to notice, ah, like what are the things that I'm doing that feel supportive, that feel helpful and noticing what works, including noticing what are the foods and the ways of eating that are supportive. So that's the first foundation. Yes, and I appreciate what you're saying about um, words like mindfulness kind of being given other meanings and, and departing from their original, more simple intention and um, being in proximity to, but not having participated in the programs here in the Center for Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. I, I, I've heard and understand that they've been able to demonstrate such powerful support from the practice, which doesn't necessarily need all the trappings or you know perceptions that people then attach and say, I can't, right? I can't empty my mind. So I'm not good at meditation. Mindfulness isn't for me. <clears throat> and I love that you um, speak to the curiosity that is part of that, because I think that's so powerful when we allow ourselves to be curious and ask questions and be aware of answers or what comes up. There's a lot of wisdom we can find from ourselves in that. Yeah. If you're listening to this podcast and you have had those thoughts, like I can't do it, or my mind is not blank or you know, I, um, mindfulness isn't for me, though I was interested in it. Um, if you've been practicing alone or practicing with an app, I invite you to, to get in contact with a teacher. And um, there's so many opportunities these days, whether it's um, online or live to, or live online, um, but also in person some, in some ways now, um, to be able to get in touch with a teacher who will often be able to invite you to bring in more kindness to your practice. And that's a lot of what I do. Beautiful, thank you for that. And then are there, in addition to mindfulness, other aspects of the program Nourishing Your Mood? Yeah, so I said there's three foundations and that's one. Um, uh, the second foundation is one of body liberation, and that is really important um, because when I started talking about, oh, it's so exciting that it's possible to take care more of your mood by attending to what you're eating, then the mind in our cultures goes to that idea about body. And so I'm doing a lot to really say all bodies are welcome here and it's not at all about changing anything about the body. So um, fat bodies, all bodies are welcome. I also work a lot with um, transgender and non-binary people and all bodies and all body experiences are, are welcome. And so that ends up being a really repeated theme of the course and people who are coming from those communities who have felt not included in other spaces um, end up feeling a lot more um, acceptance. And so that's another really important step. And so again, if you're listening and you're wanting to know more about this, you know, I encourage you to you know, follow you know, teachers and leaders, whether it's on social media or if you're like me and you like more to you know, read a traditional book with a cover, you know, there's 
for example, there's a book called Body of Truth. Um, there's Health at Every Size. There's the association that I'm a member of called the Association for Size Diversity and Health. There's a lot of ways to start to follow, as I was saying, countercultural ways of approaching our wellness. So, so that's another um, one of the two of the three founding principles of Nourish Your Mood. Beautiful. And I'm, and I'm so grateful that you speak to that too, because I, I do believe it is important. And it's heartbreaking to me to see in some aspects how people feel excluded from practices or from groups because of preconceptions that, um, that our society has, has adopted. And so thank you. I, I appreciate that you create these spaces where people can come and, and re-engage and see themselves and feel included. Absolutely. And I realize, you know, that again, that I'm creating these spaces because it's so much of the medicine that I needed too, right? I think that that feeling about not feeling included or, you know, um, this kind of illusion of separateness that we talk about in mindfulness um, is, is so common in these days. And then of course, we're we're suffering from it a lot more during this time when there was physical separation from one another. And so um, that, that way of affirming that we belong to each other and we belong to the earth is, is a really important healing for it these times. Mm, mm, that's really beautiful. Absolutely. That connection to each other and to the earth is, is fundamental. And so the third foundation the third foundation of nourish your mood is nourishing food. And you can see how, you know, again, a beginning for this one um, is just to start to notice, you know, are there ways that you could nourish yourself more? And if you're listening, you know, sometimes um, people will say um, something different than that, which is, oh, maybe you don't know me. Like I actually need to nourish myself less. You know, there's so much encouragement in these cultures um, to nourish ourselves less. And that is a place that really can set us up in so many ways for, you know, that great word being hangry. Like I heard once on the radio, someone talking about being hangry in a book about being hangry. And so I went to find it online and there's a lot of books about being hangry, including kids books about being hangry. Cause you know, kids, when they're hangry, woo. That was a hard one for parents and caregivers, right? So big people, small people, same thing, right? And I work a lot with, with couples and we, it's difficult to interact with our beloved when we're, when we're crashing like that. So finding ways to you know, consider like, what would it be like to begin the day with really considering you know, what are the foods that could support me? And one of the motions that I often use for mental health nutrition is like hands lifting you up from underneath. So all the other kinds of practices that we do, whether it be, you know, psychotherapy or even just pleasurable things like the beach or hanging out with a friend, um, these things um, are still important, meditation, all of that, but this is giving us more biological, physical support from our being. So that may be what feels, you know, underneath us, how low we, you know, drop is not quite so low and there's more, there's more support. So getting curious about what are some things you could add in either whether it's the time of day or how frequently or how much or what you eat, you know, those different kinds of things. What is it when I do that, that starts to feel a little more ease, a little bit more evenness. And where instead of feeling like irritable and, and shut down and spacey, I feel more present, more joyful, more sexy, more alive, more connected. I really love that image. Thank you for that, that uplifting. I think that that should be kind of a, you know, what nourishing really means. And that really lands with me that people, that you hear people say, was it I need to nourish myself less or something in that regard? Like they're not worthy of that. And I, it breaks my heart to see that. And, and I see that in some of the people that I work with too, and that they find their own value or worth in how much they give to other people without recognizing that without taking care of themselves, what do they have left to give to other people? You know, and so to turn that around, I think that's a really empowering and important part of what you're sharing and, and healing that relationship with food. 
So nourishing food is a really important. Yeah, exactly. And of course, you know, it's beautiful that the people you work with want to give to other people, right? It's beautiful. And, and in fact, I would love for us all to give more to each other. You know, um, the part that's extra and unnecessary is adding the self-criticism with that of like, I'm giving to other people because you said there's some inherent way I'm not feeling worthy, right? Um, and so what's it like to give to other people from a place where we're feeling more supported ourselves? And so some of, you know, what, what we're practicing, things like the self-compassion break is ways to bring compassion to ourselves in a moment. Mm. And the research, you know, that Kristen Neff has done in self-compassion is that when we are compassionate to ourselves, we are more compassionate to others. So it's more of a, of a win-win. Um, in, in Buddhism, there's this idea called the near enemies. So if you think about um, compassion, so, you know, clearly a far enemy of compassion would be something like hate or judgment, right? That's, that's obvious, right? We can tell that that's an opposite, right? But a near enemy is something more like a near enemy of compassion might be something like pity, you know, like, oh, there's this person sitting on the sidewalk. I'm going to put some money in their cup, but like look away and try not to like smell them and think like, I'm so different than them, right? Um, you know, there's different ways that we can, you know, separate ourselves from someone and like, I'm the giver and you're the receiver and we're so separate, right? And I'm above you in some way, right? And this can happen in our relationships too, not just with someone that we don't know. And I think, I think that's an important illustration because those perceptions can be really damaging when we think that we're acting out of for example we're acting in compassion but we're using it as an emphasis of, of separation and that distortion is and and so i'm remembering of course that where we started this was right about self-criticism right so even that kind of separation we can do inside of ourselves right that like judgment of there's some aspect of myself that's not feeling included or that I'm trying to push away. So the invitation is to open to those parts of ourselves. And it's hard to do that alone. You know, Annie Lamott says, my mind is a dangerous neighborhood. I try not to go there alone. <laughs> so community is helpful. Yes, yes. And, it, and it's really helpful to have the reflection of someone who has walked in that path and has experience and perspective to help see right to hold that compassion and and drop the judgment that we don't need to be holding against ourselves lovely and um what are some ways in which you've seen nourish your mood help people move out of depression and anxiety so um some of it is um through you know i mentioned these three streams and it's almost like any of those ends up being a door. You know, someone said to me recently, I used to hate cooking. Um, and I used to wait to start cooking till I was already starving. And now um, I cook um, before I leave for work. And then when I come home, I really, you know, enjoy something that's already already made, right? So it's like when you're your recent past self has done something for your recent future self. And you can thank your past self, like, thank you for making me this beautiful, you know, meal. Um, and they said, and when I'm cooking, when I'm not starving, um, it's actually really interesting and, and relaxing and, and joyful and, and pleasurable. And they're just finding a lot of ways to connect to it. Um, so simple things like that are, are really not simple, you know, because um, again, there's so many, ideas and pressures against being able to set ourselves up for success that way, you know, um, but um, the people that I study, whether it's Leslie Korn or the other leaders in mental health, nutrition and functional medicine um, have found um, looking at both really strong um, recent modern research and also looking into you know, long standing traditional foods um, from all over the globe. They're foods that have really been shown to be supportive for preventing and also um, helping to heal 
um, anxiety and depression. And so we're playing around, you know, with eating some of these foods and seeing how we feel. There's a lot of diversity among humans in so many different ways. And one of those is the way that we respond to what we eat and not everybody is the same. So well, the way that the program is set up is that every meeting, um, and I've taught this on a model of a weekly model, and I've taught it on a mo model of uh, monthly with a touch base um, halfway through the month. So it, at, at this point, it's every month in the past and maybe in the future, again, it's been every week, but every meeting there's three practices based on, you know, the ideas that we were talking about. And so one of them is some practice of eating meditation or body gratitude or self-compassion practices around mindfulness and specifically mindfulness of food. And then a color. So we eat our way through what Leslie Korn calls the brain bow, the rainbow and the brain bow. Um, and, and the color also alerts us to joy and pleasure and excitement and creativity and art. So we have a color every month and then a grouping of foods um, of specific types that have been shown by research to be helpful for anxiety and depression for some people. So the invitation is try the meditations, try the foods, try spices, foods and drinks of these colors and these types of foods and see when you eat them, pick something to track. So for some people that's energy, mood, sleep or pain um, or focus or cognitive health, memory and focus pick something, try this, and over time track it and see what you notice. And so people are starting to notice, oh, over time there's these, there's these shifts and I don't feel so on edge and I don't feel so anxious and I feel you know, more of these opportunities for, for joy or something a little bit quieter and more subtle, like I might feel kind of okay. You know, It's like a beginning of finding something that's just neutral, which hasn't been even accessible. Yes. <clears throat> and I, and I think it's so, um, so helpful to, to have that space to explore and to observe change as it's able to come about. And, um, that self-awareness again, coming back to the, the fundamental, you know, of, of mindfulness is just being aware and present to yourself and how you're feeling. And not necessarily waiting for that joy to happen and calling that the good day, but I feel neutral today. This is better than I felt yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And neutral, right? In in mindfulness, we we teach about how neutral is the part that the mind sometimes wants to skip, right? It's like I will notice something terrible or something amazing and neutral. I'm like, okay, nothing to see here, right? And neutral can actually start to be quite expansive you know, quite interesting. I remember uh, an in-person meditation retreat from the before times. Remember the before times? Remember other humans? Um, <laughs> where I was walking and I just found this bee that was crawling on the ground. And I just got down on the ground with her for the longest time, you know, and just hung out with this, with this bee. And I think she was dying, you know, and my heart just broke you know and there's a way that when we get that aware we can open to the suffering of many experiences including our own um, and but open to it in a way that we feel more able to be present and less overwhelmed mm -hmm. and to and to have that space and patience with it and not try to fast forward through the process and then if we do, we have those around us to, to be present witnesses for us. That's what I love about group is that we can, again, I think the longing that so many of us have is connection. And so group is a way that we can do that for each other. Absolutely. And, and so do you still online at this point in time have group together so that that conversation is possible, even though we can't sit in a room and, and hold physical space with each other? I do. And I started teaching in person. And before the pandemic, I had moved to a hybrid model where it was 
in person for our longer meetings, which are two and a half meetings where two and a half hours where there's um, a lot of time to do a deep practice and then people can also share in, um, in small groups, share with uh, mindful speaking and listening and more kindness with each other and ask me questions in a more individualized way in a group setting. Um, and then we had a 45 minute touch base once a month that was by video and that was happening before the pandemic. Now the whole program is live. So I already had an ambition before um, what has happened to our world. Um, I had an ambition um, to be able to offer Nourish Your Mood uh, live online because I don't see uh, this program happening somewhere else. So I really feel called to do it. There are other people that are doing some of those three parts, but taking them all three of them really seriously, like the mm -hmm. deep practice of long meditations um, that, you know, we, we do meditation for, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes sometimes, and the, um, the really taking seriously about body liberation, along with saying, you know, there are other ways of living with anxiety and depression other than just learning how to cope with them. We can actually get you more physical improvement than you've experienced before if you're curious to try it. And of course, very, very humble, no promises because everyone is different, but the invitation is to see whether this invitation might speak to something that calls to you and that it might be something worth giving a try. Mm. Mm. The power of the beginner's mind. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just see. Let's just try. Yeah. Let's just be present to what is. Yeah. <laughs> it's refreshing and, and definitely something I, I think that any opportunity we can give ourselves to, to drop into that space and just invite opportunity or potential is really powerful. And, and as you said, to have permission <laughs> and support in, in going deeper through a longer meditation. Like you say, you know, there are apps abounding, there's YouTube um, meditations, but to be in that space, to be guided by one person and, you know, even through the power of Zoom, but to, to be present for a longer period of time when, you know, we're, we can still be present to each other, even in the virtual space. And it's a definite, it's a very different animal than uh, a, a pre-recorded video. And so I love that opportunity that you're creating. Um, and so I'd love to hear about, you mentioned a compassion break earlier and um, food meditation. And so can you tell us a little bit more about that or do we have time perhaps to explore that? So um, maybe we'll do a self-compassion break. So um, this is a great one to um, have in your back pocket because it's likely there'll be something stressful that could happen. <laughs> life does happen sometimes. <laughs> so life, it does happen. Um, just like, you know, when something falls and breaks, uh, a gla another glass dish falls and breaks. I'm like, gravity, they haven't canceled it yet. So <laughs> yes, it still happens. So um, there are three steps in the self-compassion break. And um, if you like, um, I will put this on uh, a recording for your listeners. Okay. So self-compassion break, there's three steps. Um, so the first step of a self-compassion break in a moment of stress is to say to yourself, and of course, everything that I'm inviting is always optional. So I'll say that here, just like I say to all of my students, you never need to do what I say, you are your own best teacher and guide, but these are some opportunities, invitations. So the first step um, to say to yourself inside your mind, this is a moment of stress. So that's mindfulness, when we're able to have a part of ourselves that witnesses what's already occurring, okay? This is a moment of stress. So if you like just saying that inside your mind right now, this is a moment of stress. And step two is to acknowledge to yourself inside your mind, stress is part of life. This happens to everyone, okay? So just acknowledging your shared humanity, your common humanity with everyone else. 
And we've been talking about that, you know, quite a bit today, right? The things that we share with each other in terms of when we feel the most lonely and the most separate, we're actually the most connected because so many other people in this moment are also feeling lonely, separate. Yeah. So uh, stress is part of life. This happens to many people. And the third step, there's an invitation to place a hand or two hands on the heart. So you can do this by one hand or two hands, or just letting the hands hover near the heart or imagining touching the heart. So all of those ways are all equally fine. So letting the hands rest on the heart or imagine them and saying to yourself inside your mind, may I be kind to myself in this moment. May I give myself the compassion I need. And we touch ourselves to remind ourselves that we're paying attention and we're paying attention with the quality of care, quality of kindness. So the touching is like that, with kindness. May I be kind to myself in this moment. May I give myself the compassion I need. And then adding to this any other things that arise for you when you imagine what you would say to a good friend who is having a hard moment. I hear you. Yeah, that's really rough. I'm here. Whatever you want to say to yourself or other wishes like, yeah, I remember that this too shall pass. And sometimes what arises when we invite compassion is the opposite of compassion. And so just knowing that that is also the most normal experience in the world and it doesn't create a problem. It just means that that wants to come up and have a witness as well. So just letting that be here too. And that is our self-compassion break. Beautiful more kindness, more compassion. And I love uh, that you illustrate too, that's something that I like to, to bring up now and then is to be as kind to ourselves as we are to the people that we care about. I think that we tend to miss that opportunity. And so that's a beautiful part to include in our compassion break. And, and again, we were talking about, you know, ways to care more about others. And so, there's caring more about ourselves and there's caring more, more for others as well. And so, you know, um, in the county where, where I live, I believe that before the pandemic, there was already like one in six people that were getting food from the food bank. It's now it's one in five. These are, these are estimates, Alameda County Food Bank. I'm sorry if I remembered your numbers somewhat incorrectly, but sometimes I remember numbers sort of with an, a feeling rather than, you know, but something like that, right? It's very, um, it's a lot of our neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's another piece that I care very deeply about, um, which is understanding how these things are gonna change partly through our own individual efforts. And they're also gonna change more through more equity and better public policy. So we can contribute by doing things like going to the local food bank where you are as a podcast listener in your county and making a contribution. This is a really important time of year, of course, when people do that a lot. Um, and we can also, you know, find out where are the places um, where your indigenous community is doing land rematriation or other kinds of projects that need support. So here it's a Segorite land trust paying the Shumi land tax or supporting at shellmound.org, supporting efforts to protect the sacred sites. And there are places like this happening, you know, all over now and finding ways to, um, return land to indigenous people. So those are a couple of really important pieces. And of course, food justice is not just giving to the food bank, it's looking at much bigger pieces, right? About what's happening with land, what's happening with what food gets subsidized and things like that. So 
yeah, things like that is such a, a kind of like <laughs> poor representation of like so many places my heart wanted to go in that moment. <laughs> but it, it, it is true. It is true. And, and I, I think it's important to remember that it, it seems like a vast, <laughs> a vast issue. I'm a farm girl from Illinois, so I resonate with a lot of these, these wow. issues, definitely, you know, and, and I see how it lands. And um, certainly over the last year, equity has become front of mind, access to health care, access to nourishing food, you know, being able to call in the resources that everyone deserves to be able to bring in. And, and so I, I appreciate that that's something that you speak to and, and remind people of and, and wherever you see yourself fitting in, wherever you can begin, I think is an important place to get started. If, I mean, if everybody chose one thing, you know, the impact would be, would be powerful. Yeah, and I think one thing is, is a, such an important principle that I would, you know, um, co-sign your document on that, right? Because um, otherwise we become overwhelmed. Um, so one thing is a really nice place. And so, you know, I'm giving a talk this weekend with a, a land acknowledgement. And I said, you know, and now uh, having done the land acknowledgement, you might tie that to one thing you want to do, learn, or give, right? So a thing, one thing. Do you know, um, have you read any of the work of Harriet Washington who writes about public policy and, and uh, mental health? She's written a lot about um, uh, African-American mental health and, and health medical apartheid. And she's beautiful work. And um, I read one of her, a couple of her, her recent books um, looking at, for example, the impact of lead on health, lead in the water and, you know, in other uh, materials. And, and really, I thought, you know, if we listen to these, you could say requests or demands for public policy change, I actually wouldn't really need to do anything because so much brain health would be taken care of, you know, by larger systems that were taking care of us in better ways. Yes, absolutely. I agree. And that's something that um, came to the fore a couple of years ago with the situation in Flint, Michigan, that's certainly not isolated to Flint. And more recently, um, there's attention going to the PFAS cleanup sites for fluorinated um, chemicals that are forever chemicals that are coming from industrial sites. And so truly, that, that awareness is important too, because as you say, um, with that responsibility, it could, it could start to resolve a world of issues, certainly the health impacts that we're seeing in people and the, some of the mental health crisis that, that can come from being out of balance, you know, as, as health suffers, because it, it is all connected, as you said. I'm so curious about your um, experience of what some wisdom that you gained from growing up close to the land like that, that supports you today. I am, you know, I'm, it's interesting. I'm, I'm deeply grateful. My family, my father's family was in central Illinois for 150 years. So they've been there for a very long time. And my grandfather um, had one of the first large scale um, hog farming operations there, which now is, you know, when he began, and I think so many things arise from better living, more efficient practices. We start into some of these endeavors with, with the best of intentions and bright hopes, and then things take on a life of their own or, or go to scale, air quotes, or you know, become industrialized and the benefit is lost and the messaging gets distorted. So, so that's something that I, that I have perspective of now as I, as I speak to you know, the problems with larger animal facilities and that sort of thing, which we're becoming more aware of. Um, but also growing up in the, in the 90s and the 80s and 90s and before um, Roundup was everywhere, you know, before genetically modified crops were, were a thing. And so they were testing those in the fields around us. And um, now I, I'm in Southern California, but even here, I 
meet a lot of people from the Midwest and seeing the autoimmune issues that they share that I believe are related to having been in that area at that time mm. when it was all, mm. you know, mm. a testing ground. So, so it's interesting. And I think in many cases, um, we want a simple single solution. There's so many different factors. So it, it tends to be a little sticky. We, we like to simplify things, but I think that, um, and this is a conversation I've seen people having recently, we are, we are capable of nuance. We can understand that things play together and um, impact each other. Yeah, yeah. I was reading and there was a study in, um, I think in 2000 about the number of adult Americans that were um, descendants of people who got land from the Homestead Act, which sounds like is like around the time that we're, describing and the locations that we're, we're describing. And um, the, in 2000, a fourth of the adult population um, of the United States descended from people who got land from the Homestead Act. And I found out like how many of the adult population was white. And it seems like a third of the adult population um, in 2000 would be descent of the white adult population was descended from those folks. So I met someone recently who also came from farmland in the Midwest, and they are thinking that when they inherit it, they want to give it back to indigenous people. So um, again, like so many of the things we're saying, come around and circle back together, right? It's, um, and when you say nuance, I think that's a really good word because like, how do we hold, you know, living with all these realities? It's very complex. Absolutely, absolutely. And the stories that we're seeing of inequity as, as, as you're, you're pointing out, you know, the imbalance between access to white residents versus what was made available to, to black people and people of color and, the first nation, certainly, mm -hmm. who lost any rights at all. So it is, it's, it's worth examining and, and being honest, even with those difficult questions. We have to keep coming back to that. And being mindful and practicing compassion. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can do, we can do complex things. Yes. I have a lot of faith for what we can do when we work together. Yes. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you for everything that you've brought to the conversation. I think there's so much to think about here. I think this is worth coming back to not only because of the delicious compassion break in the middle there, but also just to take one thought away from, with, from the conversation, just take one thing worth pondering or, you know, as you move through and look, look at life and the way that we operate through different lenses and, and ask the kind of questions that we should be asking. Yeah, and a nice, you know, potential take home, we talked about, you know, different, you know, take homes from this um, would be again, asking yourself, like, if I bring a friendly attitude toward myself right now, like what, how might I treat myself now if I was my friend, if I were a friend? Um, and then, you know, how might I get curious about the points in my day when I notice moments of worry, anxiety about what other people think of me, you know, irritability with my beloveds, and that really frustrating, tired and wired feeling when I'm so exhausted, but I can't really rest or sleep. And just noticing these moments and what might be some ways I might get curious about, like, what could I add in? So there's so many programs that are out there about removing, you know, and these teachers that say like, okay, read my book and go take all the food out of your cabinets and then only put my food in. And I'm like, great. Now you have a person who's hungry, has no food at home and might not know how to use a cutting board. Like that is a recipe for suffering, you know? So it's not about taking away. I very rarely talk about that, but it's like, what, what might you get curious about adding in, whether that's again, something that's, you know, more frequent or a little bit more or starting early, earlier in the day with some, you know, more of a meal and seeing like, oh, what might be the impact of these changes on how I'm relating to my own mind stream and to the people I care about and to the work that matters to me. Absolutely. And I, and I love that permission to stop depriving ourselves 
That's and really look instead for something to, that we can bring in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially because it's winter time. And this is a time when animals and humans, you know, start looking to things that feel, that feel warm, that shelter and cushion and nourish our body and brain. And it's a wonderful time to, you know, to take care of our, ourselves that, that way. And, um, and in our culture, it's a very confusing time, you know, in terms of like these feelings. So, um, and, and at the solstice, it's a nice time to take good care of, of ourselves and of our neighbors. Yes. And, and I want to take this opportunity too. So this episode should be coming out right around the end of the year before the holiday. And so you have an event that you've put together for the solstice for a little extra nurturing. Yeah. So um, on my website, which is center for stress reduction.com. If you, as a listener of this podcast would like to know about upcoming by donation public programs, you are welcome to go and put your put your name in and find out, um, sign up to find out about what's coming up. During long stretches of the year, I don't have any programs, so you won't receive you know, any email. And then at this time of year, it might be you know, up to about once a week sometimes. Um, and then I've also set aside some specific um, space um just for the three times less stress and you can give that url if you want um the event that's coming up is going to be um a solstice event meditations and holiday foods for winter blahs a science to boost your solstice mood um and that'll be coming up um in december so after some of the winter holidays and before some of the other ones and then um we will also have um, more events coming up um, in in the new year uh, leading up to when nourish your mood starts to find out more about how to get more connected as well as um, teaching events for health coaches nurses therapists and other medical providers who want to find out more beautiful I think it's I think it's such an important and empowering message so I hope that people do take that time to visit your website that is center for stress reduction.com and for our listeners a bonus page is there on the site so if you're on the site center for stress reduction.com forward slash 3x less stress dot html there you will find some resources that Reba's put together just for us and so you can enjoy those well that are and, uh, collected yes and the page is is hidden from public navigation so um you'll only be able to find it by putting in that url and we'll have that link in the show notes too so <laughs> <laughs> beautiful is there anything else you want to uh to leave folks with as we're as we're wrapping up today, we've covered so much. I'm so grateful for your time and your insights and your wisdom. And I hope, like I said, people take the opportunity to, to take away just one thing for a little contemplation. Yeah. I mean, um, I would say that, you know, some of the upcoming programs um, are going to be fundraisers and we've really seen the impact of that. Uh, last year we did a fundraiser for the new Georgia project. And then we got two new senators from Georgia. So that seemed to go well. <laughs> And um, we can't say that our little fundraiser was the thing, right? But it feels good to be part of these larger things. And, you know, research shows that volunteering is good for physical heart health, for cardiac health, you know. Um, and we also last year were really doing a lot to, to support a local program that, that was a farm that was delivering um, free food in Richmond, California. Um, and this year I'll be doing some fundraisers for what I, we had mentioned earlier, which is the Agora Te Land Trust um, to uh, rematriate indigenous land here in the mm -hmm. Bay, which is an indigenous uh, women-led land trust. So feel free to participate, join us, love to meet you in one of those upcoming meetings. Beautiful. I love the work that you do. Thank you so much for your commitment and your insights and wisdom and for making time today. Thank you for volunteering to serve the community through, through doing these educational meetings. And I look forward to talking with you again soon. Take good care. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in today. 
Check out the show notes for any links we mentioned. To learn more about living life with less stress and more flow, visit happifiedlife.com. And if you found value in today's episode, make sure you subscribe to catch the next one and leave a review to help fellow pod surfers find Happified. Until next time, keep on shining.